The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, son of the black sword, back scratcher of the itchy adventurer, and a view through the gimlet eye. Fictional Christmas cheer and notional nods to the ancients. Thus we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. We have part one of a two-part interview with Larry Correa on his new debut epic fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. This is book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. Bain publisher Tony Weiskopf also joined us for the interview. This one is a lot of fun, so get ready for that. We also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. Now the news. Ho, 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 December is upon us, or under us, or within us, or all three. We have two original trade paperbacks that just got dropped off by the sleigh at booksellers everywhere. Rhythm of the Imperium by Jody Lynn Nye is book three of her Lord Thomas Canego space adventure fiction series. In this one, Canego's new hobby is interpretive dance. His Jeeves-like assistant Parsons is unperturbed by Thomas's dancing, although it is highly perturbance-inducing in others. Jeeves in Space, Interpretive Dance, What's Not to Like? It's a good book. Also out now is some somewhat more intense fare in Come the Revolution by Frank Chadwick. This is the sequel to How Dark the World Becomes. In this one, Sasha, our crook-turned savior, has become the guardian of two alien children who a lot of folks want dead. In the midst of revolution, Sasha has to keep them safe, and maybe save humanity from perpetual indentured servitude to alien masters. Frank Chadwick, by the way, is um, is the game designer, Frank Chadwick, who uh, is pretty famous in his field. Original trade paperbacks Rhythm of the Imperium and Come the Revolution are now available at booksellers everywhere. This is part one of a two-part interview with Larry Correa and Tony Weiskopf discussing Larry's new debut epic fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. We'll have part two of the interview next time on the podcast. I want to welcome Larry Correa to the podcast. Hey, Larry. Hey, how you doing? Larry Correa is the creator of the New York Times best-selling Monster Hunter International series, including Monster Hunter International, Monster Hunter Vendetta, Monster Hunter Alpha, Monster Hunter Nemesis, and Monster Hunter Legion, as well as the creator of the Magic Noir-themed Grim Noir Chronicles, set in the 1930s where magic works, which include Hard Magic, which we've serialized in audiobook form here on the podcast. He's the co-author with Mike Coopery, of soon to be three books in the Dead Six series, including Dead Six and Swords of Exodus and whatever Project Blue becomes. Larry has been an accountant, part owner of a gun store, shooting instructor, and a competitive shooter himself. He grew up in the California outback on a farm and now lives in Utah. Larry's latest book is the first novel in a new epic fantasy series. The series is called The Saga of the Forgotten Warrior, and the book is Son of the Black Sword. It's now out at booksellers everywhere. Also here today is uh, Tony Weiskopf, Bain Books publisher. Hello. Hi, Tony. Hello, everybody. Larry, the, the books you've written so far have been set either in the present or in an alternate history not too far removed from the present. Did you want to try something different with Son of the Black Sword, or has this book, book been brewing for a while with you? Uh, the book's been brewing for a while. Actually, I had the, uh, I had the idea... Uh, back when I was writing Monster Hunter Alpha is where this project started. Uh, and I brainstormed it. The first person I ever brainstormed was Mike Cooper. It was actually during a road trip down to Arizona for a book signing. And uh, so he was the first person I ever told the plot to. And I, I grew up on epic fantasy. I mean, uh, but 
that was one of my favorite stuff to read as a kid, so I always kind of wanted to do one. I mean, Grim Noir actually started out. Uh, the basic idea is I kind of wanted to write an epic fantasy, but it turned into a 1930s alternate history. <laughs> uh, you know how that goes. This one, yeah, I, I've been, this has been brewing for quite a while, and so I was really excited to, to finally get a chance to write it, and it, it came out really good. I'm really proud of it, and it was fun to create a world from scratch. So everything else was like I was taking the existing world and tweaking it. This was this was different. So I had a lot of fun with it. Well, since we have Tony here, how did you sell it to her? Other than the fact that your books sell <laughs> extremely well. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I, I, you'd have to ask Tony that. I just show up with a lot of enthusiasm and tell her stuff. <laughs> did you just talk, talk to her about it and then write it? Or had you already uh, done it? No, I told her. I told her about it in advance. I just I went to Tony and I said, "Hey, I've got an epic fantasy series uh, that I want to do, and it's, this is the basic idea." And I bounced off her, and she's like, "That sounds great." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I grew up with the with, with the Conan and uh, the Lord of the Rings, so I, I'm always looking for you know a really great epic fantasy. Um, and of course, we published Dita Paxnarian back in the '80s, and. Um, I, I, that 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 kind of fantasy, that that kind of um, drop into a world and get swirled up into the the magic of it, 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 it that that's a feeling that I want to get again. So I, yeah, I was excited about this when Larry uh, proposed it. Well, we, we we think it turns out turned out pretty well too. Um, oh yeah. And the setting um, sort of is the it, as with most epic fantasy, that's that's where you start with. Um, have you, you have a really interesting one here, and it's not your standard uh, medieval Europe, right, Larry? No, it's actually, um, it's kind of a mismatch of cultures, primarily India, um, but it's really kind of East Africa stretching over to Southeast Asia uh, is where I drew from uh, inspiration and culture, and, and it's kind of some of those and none of them at the same time. It's got a lot of tweaks in there, but, but I drew most heavily on uh, uh, India. For, for inspiration, just historically and culturally, and uh, uh, a lot of most of the naming conventions come from India, um, and so I don't know. I, it was that was actually a lot of fun, and I, I just did that because it sounded fun. <laughs> so I guess four years ago or whatever, when I started working on this and I was trying to come up with the setting, uh, just because the way the story was set up, I mean the original idea for the story, I needed a cast system. And mm -hmm. I needed untouchables. I needed like a, a, a castless group of people. And if you look at our world, that was kind of the big, most obvious um, historical, um, you know, fit. So that's that's kind of where I went for inspiration from there. So that, it was a lot of fun actually, because I, I got to read a lot of different things and poke around, and uh, it, that was interesting. It, it was fun to do something that wasn't like you know. Vikings. <laughs> <laughs> so, Don't get me wrong, I love Vikings. I married one. So. I, I've met Bridget, that's true, yeah. <laughs> um, but it, tell, tell us more specifics about your, your source material. Um, oh, gosh. Mostly, mostly history. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything in particular. I, just, I, I, would, I would say if I had to pick a century that's closest to uh, historically, it would be like the... Uh, basically, look at like the Maharaja era, uh, you know, and, and I was getting kind of the 1500s, basically. Uh, plus, I, I had an ancestor that uh, was a conquistador that uh, was one of the people that uh, occupied Goa, and so that was interesting to read up on. Historical, or uh, not historical, but um, I'm trying to think of the right word here, epics from that was, there, there's a pretty famous story, the, the whole Ramayana, or Ramayana and uh, I used that. Uh, kind of get like a view of like your heroic epics. Um, I don't know, just miscellaneous things here and there, and then various people on Facebook <laughs> they're from there, and I bounce, hey, how do you say this? What does this mean? Ooh, that's a cool historical tidbit, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. But it's not set on Earth, right? But at the same time, if I wanted to do something different, I just could. Um, so I don't know. I love world building. I spend a lot of time world building just for kicks. How would you describe the the continent? It's called Locke, right? Yeah. Is it um, mostly desert? Does it have everything in it? I know it's got a lot of mountains. It's it's uh, size wise, it's probably a little bit bigger than Australia. 
<clears throat> and it's a southern hemisphere. But um, and in the in the map, it's a little more straightened out than it would be, uh, I guess, because we don't uh, on the compass there. So there's a northern peninsula that stretches up towards the equator, um, and so it's really warm. It's really hot up there. It's, that kind of gets into jungle, jungle terrain. Um, and then as it gets to the south, it gets it gets colder until you get to the southern provinces, where it's just a miserable, awful existence where it drops from mountains to basically just miserable tundra. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one cool thing is it's set on one continent of the world because the sea is hell. You uh, can't cross the ocean. It's been it's been uh, you know probably about a thousand years since the last time mankind went out in ships. Because what happened was, um, you know, this was a pretty thriving world, and then they refer to it as the war in heaven. Um, it, it's how the people know it now. And it basically began to rain demons from the sky, these horrific, really hard-to-kill monsters. And they just rampaged, and they just basically destroyed most of the world and killed off most of the, the mankind And uh, until they were driven back into the ocean. Well, since then, the demons have lived in the ocean, and mankind lives on the continent, but man doesn't cross the seas anymore, and they've kind of rebuilt since then. So they've got this society set up where, um, you know, only really poor, miserable people live near the ocean. Everybody <laughs> else is kind of sucked in as far from you can, because demons do encroach once in a while. They trespass. Uh, yeah, Ashok, your main character, is kind of freaked out by e any water, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, because what happens is they've kind of built up, because religion has been banned, and you know, I'll get into that, but, so this is a secular society, they don't, they, they, they have a society of law, but, you know, they've kind of replaced uh, religion with law, but part of that is, you know, water, uh, or, or bodies of water is considered the source of evil, so the ocean is like the ultimate evil, um, fresh water is tolerated, because we need it, we have to, we need it to live, obviously, um, so they actually have it's legally stated. I mean, I mean, also it mandates that you bathe, <laughs> even though you find water water distasteful. Um, but it's they, they, so they're kind of like they're very superstitious about it. So all the upper class people, all the higher caste people, can't swim. Um, not that demons go up fresh water very often. They do once in a while, but it's rare. But it's just basically it's like this taboo that you don't go in the water deeper than you can see your feet. Because, you know, it's evil. Something will get you. It's impure. And so the main character being such a stickler for the law is worse uh, on that topic than most people. He's, he's even, because he's a zealot. And so he's a little more unreasonable about that than your average person would be. So and it's kind of fun because, uh, boy, people just make fun of fish. <laughs> the idea of eating fish is for, like, really, really poor people. <laughs> and so that's a... That's a slang, you know, uh, fish eater is a, is a horrible, horrible insult. Um, I've got a bunch of stuff in there that is kind of fun culturally that, you know, it, it, uh, yeah, so, so, I mean, the main character is, he's terrified of swimming, the, the concept. So, of course, I have to dunk him, you know, because that's how it goes. Because mm -hmm. you're an author and you like torturing your characters. <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. And it's one of those, it's like, it's a choice of, you're getting shot with arrows and set on fire, and it's either that, or go in the water, and you still have to debate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's that's the uh, wonderful bridge scene in the novel, right? With the oh, that bridge scene. Yeah, that bridge scene was great. <laughs> yeah. That was fun. We can't talk too much about it because it's a big spoiler, but it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good. Thing. And plus, I watch a lot of uh, I watch a lot of foreign films, and uh, I love Asian action movies. Mm. So I, I took a lot of took a lot of cues from, not necessarily Indian movies, I don't really uh, like Indian movies as much as I like Chinese or Indonesian movies, mm -hmm. um, but I, I took a lot of action uh, scene cues from that kind of thing. Are, are, are there not, not that over, the, it wasn't flamboyantly over the top, um, a little more gritty, but uh, just stylistically, I enjoyed that kind of, uh, that kind of thing. So the whole visuals of, uh, I won't say too much, but the, the bridge fight and other things like that, so... Are, are, are there particular directors or movie titles you can direct us to? Oh, okay, it's not a fantasy movie at all, but there's one... You know, I have in the in some of the Black Sword, there's the, the party scene that turns into a knife fight? Yes. Um, that, that came about because I was watching a movie called uh, 
a uh, man from nowhere from Korea. That's actually from South Korea. Hmm. And uh, the main character in that scene is just so coldly competent. There's a knife fight scene in, uh, in Man from Nowhere that I watched it and was like, holy crap, I've got to write a knife fight scene like that. That was amazing. Uh, so that's where that came from, and uh, that particular sequence. Uh, and then you got a lot of your epics. Um, not, not, not that it's culturally very different, but the final fight scenes, there's a movie called uh, 13 Assassins, which I think is one of the greatest movies mm-hmm. ever made. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a Japanese movie, but, but the, it's a culturally very different because it's samurai, this is not samurai. But there's a fight sequence at the end of 13 Assassins, Except instead of 13 guys, it's one guy, but that's basically kind of what I did for the, uh, for the end of uh, the final fight scene in Son of the Black Sword. Okay. So. Cool. Yeah, I'm a sucker. I'm a sucker for action flicks. I'm shocked. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm a sucker for monster movies, too. So if you read the Monster Hunter <laughs> series, that's like my love song, the monster flicks. <laughs> well, tell us about Ashok since we're talking about him. Um, he, he's one of the guys that can kill a demon. He's a protector. So what does, what is a demon really? And what is, uh, what, what can it do to a person? And, um, how does he kill the things? Well, uh, okay. So the demons are the creatures that fell from the heavens a long time ago. Uh, most people have never seen one. Because remember, they try to live far away from, you know, far from the ocean. Uh, they are... A hideous, unearthly type creature. I can't give away too much. We've only seen a couple so far in the series, but they do come in all a variety of shapes and sizes. Um, the ones we do see in this are basically humanoid, about seven feet tall, about 350, 400 pounds, sleek, black, um, no visible eyes or, or you know, no no organs for sight or um, hearing that you could see. Their skin is really, really hard. It's really impervious to damage. And if, if you rub it, it's like very smooth one direction. You rub it the other way, and they'll take the skin right off your hand. Mm-hmm. They're, um, they're very, very difficult to kill. And uh, so Ashok is a protector. So he's a member of like kind of a, a militant, uh, magical, roving law enforcement officer. It is kind of what a protector is. And so they're the people that kind of take care of problems like that. So they're kind of a hyper-trained um, special for anti-magical special forces group is what they are. And they work usually alone or in pairs. He is able to fight demons more effectively than most people because uh, of what he's armed with, not just his experience, but he's armed with an ancestor blade, which in this setting is an extremely rare and powerful thing. Uh, and it's actually one of the only things that's able to easily kill a demon. Everything else, you just got to poke at him and hope he get lucky. So, <laughs> but demons are rare. Uh, like like even Ashok, in 20 years, he's only seen six. Uh, and, all, and, and that's looking for them. You know, so he's only he's fought six in his entire career. Um, but yeah, they're, they're hideous. I mean, they're horrible <laughs> monsters. So, I mean, their point, I have them go up on land and they eat people and then they barf them up. Ooh. They can make room to eat more people. <laughs> So when you're tracking one, it's like you just follow, you just follow the path of destruction, and at the end you'll find a horrible monster that will probably eat you. Um, so is this based on cats? Say <laughs> what? Is this based on on cats, like house cats? <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, they're about uh, they they care for humanity about that much. <laughs> <laughs> That's really evil. <laughs> No, I mean, I get it. As the series goes on, you learn more about where they come from. But in the first book, I don't get into that too much. Yeah. Um, we, we, we don't want also to... Also smarter than people think, too. So, oh, but we, we get into that just a little bit as it goes on. Yeah. I've got, I've got some cool stuff planned. We'll Tony tell... knows. I think I, I've told Tony what they are. I, I, and I'm not going to tell. <laughs> <laughs> we we want to keep... It's actually, and it's kind of cool. I have a... Uh, so the magic system in this, there's, there's a couple things that have magic. Um, that you can get magic from, and so demon parts are one of them. So there is an illicit trade in demon bits. Um, so like when you kill a demon, you can part out the corpse uh, and sell the bits. And so it's all tightly regulated. It's all controlled by the government. You know, there's like lawful magic. 
And so what happens is there's actually kind of a thriving underground illegal magic trade uh, mm-hmm. in demon parts. So uh, that's something we get into the series a little bit too, which is kind of fun. And that's one of the things that the protectors uh, stop because that's part of their duties is is killing magic smugglers. So that, that's I don't know, that's kind of different. Right? Oh, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Tell us about the um, since it tell us about that sword, the black. Uh, it's black, right? It's part of the title. The ancestor. Yeah, well, it, the sword is uh, the sword is named um, Gruvadal, and uh, what it is, it's been around for a long time. And it, when the demons fell from from heaven, they were just destroying mankind until one hero. Uh, the, the 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 legend is a, the god sent a hero uh, who basically fell from the sky in a ship of fire crash-landed in Locke and took the fight to the demons. He taught mankind how to use magic and united the tribes, and they defeated the monsters. Uh, and they were armed with what was called black steel, which, as we get into the series, is one of the uh, sources of magic, and it's the purest, most potent source of magic. And it's just this, can't say too much, but it's a super material that has abilities that human beings can trap or use and draw upon. Uh, and now weapons built out of this stuff are are basically usually semi-sentient, as far as people can tell. They pick who is allowed to use them. Um, and it's in their logic and their, their reasoning is kind of unknowable. No one really understands the weapons. Um, and as time has gone on, there's less and less black steel because it does get used up. It has basically a charge of how much, uh, uh, you know, use it has, and as time goes on, there's less and less. And also, so these blades, these weapons that were forged by the great original hero to drive the demons off, are handed down over time. And uh, they are super valuable, they're super important, they're kind of not just a cultural, uh, not just a weapon, but they're also kind of a cultural, symbolic thing of a house. So you have this, like, a great house as kind of a political entity, They'll have their ancestor blade, and that's their prestige. That's their, their they, they take prestige and honor and dignity from the fact that they have these things. It makes them special. And so, over time, though, they because these weapons have their own honor code, as that honor code is violated by their bearers, they destroy themselves. And uh, when the bearers die, they uh, a new successor will try to wield it. So it's kind of like that little element of the Excalibur legend there. Mm-hmm. You have a you have a really cool uh, choosing ceremony, which is oh, it, it's kind of like Harry so Potter's violent. capping ceremony, except with like, like soaked with blood. <laughs> yeah, what happens is um, you know the, the, no one knows how the blades choose, how the weapons choose their successors. So when the prior bearer dies, they basically just have it there, and then uh, people who think they're worthy, and they have to be warrior caster above warrior caster. The priest, or there's no longer a priest class. It's basically a bureaucrat management class. Um, they will try to wield these things, and what happens is they will pick it up, and the sword will will basically test them. It will decide is this person worthy. And um, for, for for the onlookers, they'll just see this person pick it up. The sword will decide if they're worthy or not, and then basically their muscles will contract, and they'll either they'll cut themselves with the weapon, which with these things is often fatal. Uh, in really horrible, gruesome ways, or it'll accept them, and they'll become the new bearer until they die. So, um, <laughs> that's a big plot point of this book, is these people uh, are attempting to take over and, you know, become the new bearer of um, Gruvadal, and it is unforgiving. <laughs> like, if it, and for most people, it's like, it's like, and I can't give too much away by like, who the person is observing this, but, uh, so the narrator in the sequence is watching this happen, and so this guy picks it up and basically lops off both of his legs, and it, it like immediately lops off both of his legs, and he's like, oh, wow, it really didn't like him much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, next guy picks it up. He makes it like almost 30 seconds, you mm-hmm. know, and then cuts himself, like slices through his arm. You know, doesn't cut his arm off, but just inflicts a really horrible cut on his arm and drops it. And he's like, oh, the sword liked him. He just wasn't good enough. But it, you know, it didn't have anything against that guy, so it's it's incredibly brutal. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to be a Hufflepuff, yeah? No, so. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's way worse. I mean, it's the sorting. It'd be like if the sorting hat ate your head. 
<laughs> like a sorting hat found you unworthy and ate your head. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it sounds too like you're you're you're, uh, you're you're drawing on not only your experience as an accountant for the economics of this, but also your experience as a uh, as a game master uh, for uh, for for the creation of the uh, the universe, but also for torturing your player characters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love the GM. Uh, I often wind up as GM. <laughs> I, I thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, and, and I ran a, I ran a samurai campaign for two years during the, you know, creation of this book. So a lot of the whole honor system thing and the, uh, the, the whole, you know, government political maneuvering houses stuff. Yeah. A lot of that came through. And then one particular character, um, yeah. So I, I use gaming, I think is wonderful for authors. I think gaming is like a, it's a fantastic resource for authors to just come up with cool ideas. Um, and they tend to be dynamic ideas because you're doing them on the fly with a group of people. So I think author, I think gaming is fantastic for, for writers. I think more writers should do it. Um, it just, for me anyway, it, blends, it gives me all sorts of cool creative ideas. I, I'm not sure if it's a, a chicken or egg kind of thing there. So if just really creative writers make good game masters or if good game masters turn into good writers. I, I, I think there's got to be something, because I remember I was at a convention one time, and there was like 13 writers hanging out in the hallway. You know, you know how it is at cons, where the real action is out in the hallway where all the writers just kind of hold court, right? <laughs> a group of us. And somebody was talking about gaming, and uh, it just came up in conversations. We all sort of talked about games we played or we were in. And so somebody asked, he goes, wait a minute, okay, out of curiosity, all these writers, who who here is not a, who here is not a gamer, or who, who who here has never gamed? And of all the writers, one hand went up, <laughs> and it was uh, it was Lee Modisett. <laughs> <laughs> Lee Modisett was the only guy that wasn't a gamer. Yeah, that, that's because he that, that's because he does real world stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, Lee Lee like when Lee builds uh, Lee builds an economy. I mean, it's full on. That economy would work. <laughs> Well, and then another time we were like, this is this is a different. This is years before. So Mike Cooper is not a gamer, and so uh, we were at the gun store one time, and it was National Guard weekend, and we had a bunch of soldiers in there. We we're just hanging out, shooting the bull, and um, I picked the gun off the wall, and somebody said something. Like, yeah, that's my plus five Vorpal Holy Avenger. Everybody in the room laughs. They all they all laughed, and I looked around. I go, wait a minute, because there's a bunch of you know, big room full of combat vets. Like, wait a minute, wait, who here? Who here is not a gamer? Because everybody got it. <laughs> Mike Cooper was the only guy that had ever played Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> well, he plays. So whether it's uh, that's your writers, a lot of lot of gamer, a lot of gamer crossover in that. Yeah, I, I think you brought Mike to the dark side because we have seen him confess to falling into what's it Fallout uh, just now and oh and... no video games yeah he's a he's a sucker for video games it's okay. just tabletop I've never got him to play tabletop ah. uh, one of these days <laughs> <laughs> I'll get him I'll get him eventually <laughs> what um go, getting back to the Ashok and the Protectors thing how how and there's another selection process for the protectors as well, uh, which is pretty brutal. Um, oh, how, do you, yeah. how do you become a protector? Um, it's uh, okay. So, so think of it as kind of like I said, magical roving law enforcement. It's a small order. So what it is is the way the government's broken up is, is they have a series of houses that basically rule their provinces. And there's a central capital that oversees everything. That's like kind of your Mandarin bureaucracy that everything reports to. Um, so the protectors basically work on behalf of the capital, so they're not part of any house. But what happens is to curry favor with the capital, houses donate children, basically, children of the warrior caste or of the first caste, and they donate them to this order. And they usually kick them over when they're about 12 years old. So basically they, they're obligated to this, to this order for a period of 20 years. And if they live, they get to return to their house and they'll return in glory. That almost never happens because their survival rate is, is terrible. Um, so they kick these children over, and, and the training grounds are uh, far, far, far south in the mountains in this very horribly isolated, very cold, very mountainous, horrible, awful place. And it says they put a bunch of children there, and then it's like, 
and now we're going to beat the hell out of you and fight, starve you and freeze you and fight, and we're going to break you down and rebuild you. And there's a magical element to this too, but it, so we mentioned Harry Potter, you know, earlier. Okay, that Harry Potter wizard school is like really nice. Mm. <laughs> but ch- no, no children will dream of going to protector training, okay? <laughs> it's, it's just, it's brutal. And, uh, and then uh, they, they often die in training and they have a super high failure rate. Um, but part of it is, is physical toughness, mental toughness, and, and kind of a nebulous concept that they have. And we'll get into the morality of basically their character. Um, and so basically these, they, they, what happens is the people that come out of this program are just really hard, unflinching bastards. And their devotion to the law is just absolute. So they're kind of, they're kind of thought of by regular people as, um, basically fanatical monks, almost. Um, and they literally have a license to kill. So once they reach senior status and they are a full protector and they can go around enforcing law, they are judge, jury, and executioner. Uh, and so I, I saw a review uh, earlier on Book Tour where somebody referred to uh, some of the black sort as, um, um, he said, fantasy judge dread. Mm. Thought of that, I was like, okay, that works. <laughs> it's actually a really good pitch. Yeah. <laughs> and they can just take your stuff if they need it too, like your horse, your wine. The, 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 this is oh, yeah. They, they, and so regular people are scared of them because they can claim any property that they want in pursuit of their duties. The, the, this is called um, eminent domain. Yeah. Oh <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. They they are walking eminent domain. So what happens is, I mean, and most of these guys are they're not bad guys. But this, this is their mindset is like they, because there's a caste system and they, these guys are the top of it, uh, or almost the top of it. So when they roll into town, it's like, I need, I need four horses. Give me your horses. And it's like, okay, I have to. And it's like, so, so people fear them, not, even when they haven't broken the law, which kind of gets into the whole, this, this gets into the, this book gets a lot into my personal pet, uh, pet peeves and, you know, dead horses that I like to flog about freedom versus control. And uh, these guys are your, basically your ultimate jackbooted thug is a good way to look at it. And uh, they roll into town and everybody just does exactly what they say. And you really have no, you have no way to respond to them. Um, you do what they say or, or else. So, uh, I mean, there, there are ways you can, uh, you know, respond. Uh, you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, lobby the capital <laughs> for mm-hmm. recompense good luck or you can pick a duel I and mean, there is a elaborate dueling rules here but only a suicidal madman would pick a fight with a guy who all he does is fight so I mean, it's, it's, it was fun to write about a group of people that were uh, basically my protagonist is coming from a group of people that if I was writing in any other setting would pro- they'd probably be the bad guys. <laughs> I, so, I, I, I thought there, were, there was another character uh, who, who interested me a lot and um, she threatened to take over the book a little bit. Um, and I did find it inter- interesting that you and, and Dave Drake both have um, uh, librarians as kick-ass <laughs> uh, heroines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why don't you tell Lotta. us about, uh, about her. She, she, she will return in the second book. Um, oh, yeah. I have a, yeah. She's got a great big character. There's a bunch of stuff for her to do. Yeah. Um, That's uh, Rada. Yeah, Rada. Uh, she's the Rada the Librarian. Uh, yeah, Senior senior Archivist, senior archivist Rada. <laughs> um, okay, so the thing with her is I wanted in this book, so it opens up and Ashok's the main character, especially for the, for the most part for the first half. But as the series goes on, I'm going to bring in point of view characters from, from every cast, from every group, basically. Uh, and Rada is our glimpse into like, she's a daughter of the first cast. So she's, she's a daughter of the important political Mandarin connected, uh, group. Uh, she is awesome. <laughs> she hates people. She's actually extremely antisocial. Um, if she was alive in our world today, she'd probably be on anxiety meds. Right. And, uh, she loves books. Books don't. Books. Books are what books are. You know. And so she like eats, sleeps, lives, and breathes her library. But uh, basically, the plot of this book gets into like people tamper with her library, and, and uh, 
her life is on the line. And she, uh, she's never fought. She does, she's not a fighter. She, like I said, she's a, she comes from a very rich, peaceful, top of the social ladder group. So she's never had to like fight to survive before. Um, and so, but <laughs> she gets a little espionage action going on, but she learned it from a romance novel. <laughs> and so her idea of a clandestine meeting is, it's pretty ridiculous, and <laughs> it's actually really fun when she does that. But no, I've got a bunch of stuff planned with Rada. Um, she, she's a major reoccurring character for the series because she is that she is that cast. She is she's going to represent the well-meaning yet clueless <laughs> um, a group of people. So she's a lot of fun. She's pretty OCD, also. So she's oh, extremely little. And her and her dad is her boss because you know a lot of this is. It's what family you're born into really determines your position in life. And uh, she takes her family's business more serious than her father, who is the senior head, you know, boss of all librarians. And uh, she she's super OCD. Uh, every account, you know, I'm an accountant, so we all understand. <laughs> <laughs> but she is just hardcore. And so but she's actually the person that gets a little bit of a love story in here, too, which is kind of fun. Oh, yeah. And that is really guy who cool is who she ends up more complicated with. than good guy or bad guy. So yeah. Uh, yeah, can't give too much away there yet, but I really like I really like him. A uh, lot of pent up, lot of pent up uh, aggression over the years <laughs> from this character. Well, speaking of it being kind of a, a totalitarian state, you, you do have a secret service, and your one of your main bad guys is Grand Inquisitor Omond. Um, he's really creepy, and he he wears a mask a lot of times. Can you There's tell us about that? There's so the... much for him to do still. Uh, I've barely touched the surface with that guy, because he's, he's actually a, he's a great villain. Um, one of the things I like about writing villains is I always like writing villains who they think they're right. They, they're doing what they're doing for a reason. And we've, not really, we've only scratched the surface of what Oman's reasoning is. Um... But he's a he, he's the kind of bad guy. He's a chess master. He's a um, well, literally in the case of the series, he's a kingmaker, is what he is. He's the guy. He's the guy behind the scenes that pulls the strings, that puts everybody where they need to be. Uh, he, he's referred to in the capital as the spider in the center of the web, and he takes that as a compliment. <laughs> that, that that to him is like the greatest thing ever. It's like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Ex- explain about the masks, because we do have masks to give away. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so the thing with the mask is, um, if you notice on, on, the, on, the, on the art there on, Asha, on Ashok's chest, he has a symbol. It's kind of this leering monster face on the center of his armor. And what it is, is in this society, um, that's the law. That, that face, that evil face represents the law. It's unfeeling, its eyes are open, it sees you, it's leering at you, it's coming to get you. It's not like in Western society where we have, you know, blind lady justice with the scales. We eat you. And so what happens is um, uh, the protectors wear that symbol over their hearts. Uh, the inquisitors wear it over their face. They, they wear it as a mask. And either they've got cloth masks or wooden masks or, or metal masks, depending on, you know, what duty they're on. But the reason the inquis- Inquisitors do that is it terrifies the populace more for people to not know their identity. Plus, it enables, because they do all the undercover work and basically the secret law enforcement work. So all an Inquisitor has to do is pull his mask off and he can blend into society. And then they wear the masks for all their official duties. And so people never really know, and they come from various castes, so I've not really got into the Inquisition much, but they are recruited from various castes, too. So they've, the Inquisition has infiltrated all walks of life, every house, every society. So if you ever plot against the capital, you very well could be plotting with somebody who is an Inquisitor. Mm. And, uh, and they will they will then ruin you and kill you and your entire family. So they're kind of this terrifying secret police group. So the protector is a little more straightforward, militant, just going and slaughter you kind of thing, whereas the inquisitors are the sneaky, um, poking around secret police yeah. stuff. Well, the um, the the upper class people in capital know 
pretty much about that. There's a wonderful scene where um, Omand and uh, Rada's father are having dinner, and and Rada's father's just scared out of his skull by all this, but he has to be nice. Oh yeah, that's great. I remember that because 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 he has to like obey the society, you know, the rules. He has to like you know honor this honored guest, this grand inquisitor. He's feeding him dinner. And at the same time, at the back of his mind, he's like, oh my gosh, did this guy just kill my daughter? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and if I say anything, he will. So, yeah, Oman is just, he's just terrifying. And then Oman is just, it was a great dinner. You know, he just had a good time. <laughs> he, he goes out and has a meeting with Assassin. He's like, hey, what's up, guys? <laughs> yeah, he really liked that cook. Yeah, he's like, oh yeah, steal his cook. That was the best duck I've had in a long time. Find out who his cook is and steal him. And I don't specify, but they're probably literally stolen. <laughs> <laughs> like, middle of the night, put a sack over his head and disappeared him. <laughs> well, uh, the Inquisition is a fun bunch. I actually have, um, in the in the, in the next one, there is an Inquisitor point of view character, other than Oma, because uh, Oma, you know, he's the boss, he's the main guy. But I have a, I have a lesser functionary guy. Um, so I get to go into the, basically into the secret police a little bit, too. Hmm. So, because I, I alluded to, I have this castless rebellion going on, and I alluded to how there were inquisitors um, who were secretly, you know, part of the rebellion, who were watching it. So I, I get to get into that in the sequel a little bit. I'm, so I'm, I'm really excited to, to touch on those guys, because there's a lot. There's so much world building I haven't got into yet, because... Um, I like to reveal world building stuff in bits. I don't like to do big, um, I don't do a big ex expository history lessons. You know what I mean? That's not my style. So I, I have to reveal, I have like pages and pages of notes <laughs> that I haven't been able to reveal yet. So I'm really looking forward to that. That was part one of a two-part interview with Larry Correa and Tony Weiskopf discussing Larry Correa's new epic fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. We'll have part two next time on the podcast. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Chapter 17 Can I help? Chris said to Stacy. I don't know, Stacy said, smiling. Can you help? I may be somewhat unconfident about your husband's plan to clear the seas of zombies, Chris said, grinning. But I am a past master of galleys the world over. I was just putting some sushi together, Stacy said. We caught a big blackfin. I wasn't sure what people... Please, Chris said. It would help me to spend some time in normal conditions. I'm a chef. Oh, Stacy said, stepping back and raising her hands. Go right ahead. I'm not even that good a cook. Do you have a primary role, Chris said, starting to expertly slice the tuna. I mean your daughter, Sophie, is it? Sophia, Stacy said, or Soph. She's a helmsman, Chris said. The other is the bruiser. Call it clearance expert, Stacy said, grimacing. I really hate it, but it's what she enjoys and she's good at it. And I guess you'd call me the ship's engineer. I'm mechanically inclined, mechanical electrical. I'm just good at it. Geek stuff, sort of. I note you're all armed, Chris said. Is that an issue? Stacy said. No, I'd say it's wise, Chris said. For myself, I spent ten years under discipline in the RN. Not great discipline. I was a cook, then a chef, 
But I'm familiar with the need for discipline and authority at sea, especially in small boats. I'm fine with taking orders from your husband and you, at least for the time being. I even agree with his plan, grandiose as it seems at first glance. But others, he shrugged, keep your weapons. Any particular others? Stacy said quietly. Jack Isham owned a small manufacturing company in the States, Chris said. Nori? We packed loads, Stacy said, gesturing to a cupboard. We figured we'd be eating a lot of sushi. When we ran out of gas for the stove, when we were running out, I boiled up a bunch of rice, and it was sushi for the next week until we got this boat. As I was saying, Chris said, laying out the nori. Jack is not a bad person, but he insists on being in control. I guess it's from being his own boss for so long. So he's not going to just take orders and will, frankly, be a right pain to have around. Tom Christensen was a drug dealer taking a cruise with his stripper girlfriend. They both made it to the boat. She turned. He really didn't seem to care. Not someone to look out for others. And I suspect not someone to let into your weapons stash. I'll keep that in mind, Stacy said, tapping her pistol. She shook her head. I guess it was sort of a bad idea for there to be only two of us on the boat, huh? They're tired, Chris said quietly. They're getting used to being safe. Somewhat safe, anyway. But yes, there may be problems in the near future. Sushi. He presented the expertly arranged plate. I'll continue on this. You should probably be near the companionway below and the helm. Got it, Stacy said, taking the plate. Why? I mean... Not why I should be there. I agree with your husband's plan, Chris said. I'd even say I'm trustworthy enough to arm, but I wouldn't suggest you believe it until I've proven it. And having survived everything I've survived, I don't want to be caught in a firefight. Sushi, Isham said. That's it? He took two, though, and stuffed them in his mouth. Your stomach has to get used to food again, Stacy said sitting down between the group and the helm, and by the companionway below. Sushi surprisingly easy to digest. We've been eating a lot of raw fish, Paul said, taking one and biting it delicately. Her face assumed a beatific expression for a moment. With rice and nori, it's exquisite. Anybody who has any energy and a strong stomach? Steve asked. Boats trashed, zombie in the engine room. But there are a lot of supplies, and we can cross-load fuel and water. I'll help, Patrick said, standing up. I'm not exactly feeling great, but the soup helped. Jack? Steve asked. Do I get a gas mask? Jack asked, taking another sushi roll. Sorry, Steve said. All out. Then I'll pass, Isham said. Anybody else? Steve asked. Steve? Stacy said. Let's hold off on cross-load. We have enough stores for now, and we know which EPIRB it is. We can always come back, and there are more lifeboats to check. Just leave the EPIRB going, and we'll come back. Let's get you and Faith back aboard. Steve started to speak, then noted where she was sitting. Okay, Steve said. Sophia, next EPIRB? About ten miles, Sophia called. Lifeboat. Faith jumped aboard the inflatable life raft and cut the wire to the EPIRB with her kukri. She jumped lightly from the side onto the back deck of the yacht, then bent down and poked the fabric of the raft, holing it. I hate the ones that are just empty, Faith said, as the lifeboat started to deflate. How many have you cleared? Paula asked. I don't know, Faith said, shrugging her shoulders. You'd have to check the log. Bunch. Clear, da. Roger. Steve said. Next one, Soph. I sort of like the boats, Faith said, shrugging. She hadn't bothered to rig up for this one. Creeping around in the dark looking for zombies may not sound like fun to most people, but it is to me. To each their own, Paula said, laughing. I'll leave it to you. But the lifeboats and life rafts, Faith said, frowning. Usually everybody's dead, and usually cause the zombies got them. What happened to you guys? No zombies? No, Paula said, her face closing up. They were infected. So how'd you make it? Faith asked. You didn't have any guns. 
Right after we hit the water, Chris had us put on light restraints, Paula said carefully. Just light knots. When somebody started to turn, we could restrain them. There weren't any when we got there, Faith said, then stopped. I just realized this is something you really don't want to talk about. Sorry. Me and my big mouth. No, Paula said. And yes. I guess I'm afraid it would be hard to understand. It's not something that we even talked about on the boat. Chris, and while he was still with us, a guy named Donnie would take them out on the aft deck and deal with them. Do I want to ask? Faith said. We never did, Paula admitted. The first time Donnie and Chris took a woman, it was Tom's girlfriend. They went out back, and then Donnie came back in, and then a bit later, Chris. And he just said he'd handled it. That happened nine times. Then Donnie got bitten, and he turned. He stayed out on the back deck tied up, knowing he would turn. He said he'd been special forces, and he... He really went out like a hero, you know? And you could hear when he turned, and Chris just went out and came back. And then it was just Chris. Nobody would help him with them. I, I wanted to, but I, I'm not like you. I didn't get bitten, but I screwed up and got a cut, Faith said, showing Paula her thumb, which still bore the mark of the injector needle. Then I got into a fight with one on an elevator, and the bitch bled all over me, and I got it. But I'd had the vaccine, at least the primer, and I only got a little. So I just got sick. Really sick. It's the worst sick you can imagine. I sort of saw, Paula said. Donnie didn't go down easy. You know what was really crazy about Donnie? What? Faith asked. He was missing both his legs above the knee, Paula said, shaking her head. He said he'd lost both of them in 2001 in Afghanistan. Then went through all the process to go back on active duty and went back to Afghanistan. That's double tough, Faith said, shaking her head. I can only wish I was that tough. So, what was the thing about the last concert in New York? We need to have a crew meeting, Steve said, poking his head out the back door. He wasn't sure what Faith had been telling the survivor, but the woman's face was dripping with tears. You okay? Oh my God, Paula said, howling with laughter. I can just see Voltaire doing that. It was so not my fault, Steve said. It was her idea. It was Uncle Tom's idea, Faith said. And at least I remembered my shotgun. Anyway, Steve said. Crew mating. Chris is taking the helm. Okay, Faith said, getting up. Work, work, work. At least I didn't have you clean up that lost boat, Steve said. That boat needs to be sunk, not cleaned, Faith said. We have a potentially serious security issue, Steve said. Who? Faith asked. The meeting was taking place in the master cabin, which was the only place outside the saloon or the back deck that would take them all. All of them, Stacy said. I like Paula, Faith said. You're talking about them taking over the boat? I don't think she'd take over the boat. I like Paula too, Steve said. Paula, Chris, Patrick, I like all three. I'm not sure about the lady with the white hair. Jack's a dick, Faith said. But I don't fully trust any of them, Steve said. And yes, Jack's a dick. That was one of the big glaring holes in my plan. That I can see, but not really Phil. There's no... The term is controlling legal authority. There's no government to enforce anything. If one of them tries to take over, the best we're going to get is a firefight. There's guns, Sophia said. And we've got all the guns. Which is the point, Steve said. And we're going to have to keep it that way for a while. But that means keeping someone on the guns at all times. I don't want to just sit in a cabin guarding guns, Faith argued. Isn't how we'll do it, Steve said. We're going to have to hot bunk anyway. So? All four of us will hot bunk in here, with the door locked and bolted. Whoever is in here will have plenty of time to respond if anyone tries to break in. Carry at all times. We were when they boarded. We're just one of those families. Gun nuts.
If anyone goes for a gun, we'll deal with it. That's a way of putting it you might want to avoid, Faith said. Deal with it has a really special meaning for these guys. You guys have been asking about the land, Steve said, as they left the next EPIRB. The life raft had held only two corpses. We're going to kill two birds with one stone. Bermuda is about 200 miles from our current position. We'll clear in that direction. When we get there, we'll spend some time in the harbor. You can get a look around. I could do with a Bermuda vacation, Tom Christensen said. Until the conversation with Stacy, Tom hadn't really been on his radar. Now he was keeping him under more or less constant covert surveillance. Like I said, Steve said, shrugging, anybody who wants to get eaten can go ashore. Up to you. This is an all-volunteer operation. If it's all-volunteer, where can I get off? Isham scoffed. You want off? Steve asked calmly. There's a great big ocean. Go jump in it. Fuck you, Isham snapped. Steve drew his pistol, walked over, and put it to the man's head. When I kill a zombie, I kill a human being, Steve said. I am fully cognizant of that. Zombies are not by a long stretch, the first people I've killed, Mr. Isham. Mr. Smith, Paula said shakily, he was just... He was just being Jack, Steve said, pulling back the hammer. Mr. Isham, there is no controlling legal authority, period. Now I've said, as soon as I can find a place to put you, I'll move you off this boat. You can go ashore. But if I put a bullet in your head right now, who can gainsay me nay? B- what? Isham stuttered. Can you just put the pistol down? No, Steve said. That's the problem, you see. I can't put it down. Because I can't trust you, Jack Isham. Because you are a revolving pain in the ass. Want to be the boss and contribute nothing. Why exactly shouldn't I put you over the side? You're just consuming stores that others need. And everything about you tells me you're a threat to this boat, myself and especially my family. He pulled the pistol back, decocked it, and holstered it. I swear to God I won't try to take over the boat, Isham said. I mean, if you're mad about me not helping. If it's all volunteer, why can I get off? Steve quoted. You said repeatedly that you're not interested in helping others, period. You dominate and rest for control. You've been talking to Chris too much, Isham growled. I didn't have to have Petty Officer Phillips' confirmation, Steve said. I don't care who or what you were before this plague. What you are now is a passenger on my boat. I am the captain, the chief, the boss, the head guy. And given the situation, I cannot afford or abide any threat to that authority. So, Mr. Isham, you will need to swallow your pride, swallow your sarcasm, and understand that you are under discipline on this boat, or I will, I assure you. Put a bullet in your head and put you over the side. Do you understand? You wouldn't dare, Isham said. How about me, Faith said coldly, because I really, really think you're a prick. Isham felt the barrel of her pistol against the back of his neck and blanched. Ah, Steve said, that you can believe. I see. Now, I'm going to give you some words to say, and if you cannot say them, then Faith will pull the trigger. Please let me pull the trigger, Faith said. I bet you dollars to donuts this guy's hurt plenty of people in his time. I, Isham said, repeat after me. Steve said. I, Jack Isham. I, Jack Isham. Hereby swear. Hereby swear. To do my level best. To do my level best. To quit being a prick. To quit being a prick. To follow the orders of the crew. To follow the orders of the crew. Without the question mark, Mr. Isham. And yes... That includes the young lady with the gun to your head. To follow the orders of the crew. To follow the orders of the crew. Of the rescue boat Tina's toy. Without backtalk. Or sarcasm. To the best of my ability. 
until I can get the hell away from these nut jobs. So help me God. You can holster Faith, Steve said. Damn, Faith said, decocking and holstering. For everyone else, Steve said, I was a para in the Australian Army. I am a combat veteran, long before this current brouhaha. I am a naturalized American citizen. Immediately prior to the plague, I was a history teacher. I actually understand these times because they have been common in history. And not zombie plagues, but similar situations. Once we have more than one bloody boat for people to go on, we can determine who gets the boat and who goes on it. And we'll do that by vote. Not that you get a vote about taking this boat anywhere. But when one comes open, anyone who fears for their safety with us mad people, or who is unwilling to aid in this great endeavor, can move to that boat. Or, as I've said repeatedly, when we approach shore, you can take your chances. But until I'm assured that you are not going to mutiny, do not become a security threat. Do I make myself very clear? A chorus of yes, Captain, would be appropriate. Yes, Captain, the group said. Aye, aye, Captain, Chris said from the galley. He was spinning a rather large knife. I've got a sahi coming up, if that meets with the captain's approval. Thank you, Chris. That would be superb, Steve said. The next boat that we come to, if there are no security threats, you'll be clearing the EPIRB, Mr. Isham. Clear? Yeah, sure, Isham said nervously. Clear captain, or aye aye captain, Steve said, trying not to sigh. There really is a reason for it. So, try it again. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a woman wailing for her demon lover to wait until she finishes the Monster Hunter series before he eats her. And an elf on the shelf in the trailer park at the end of the universe. And thanks and praise to Tony Weisskopf and Larry Correa. Larry, the author of New Epic Fantasy, Son of the Black Sword. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. The Bane Free Radio Hour is brought to you by Bane Books Audio Drama. Presenting dramatized audio plays of the best science fiction and fantasy with a professional cast and cinema quality soundtracks. Now available, Eric Flint's Islands, based on the novella by Eric Flint. Also available, Larry Correa's Detroit Christmas, based on the novella by Larry Correa set in the world of the Grim Noir Chronicles at BaneEbooks.com. Just put Islands and Detroit Christmas in the search bar and enter a world of listening pleasure. Bane Books Audio Drama. <laughs>